All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started with round two of the Species Survival and Life History session. Uh, definitely a great round one, so it looks like a great round two as well. So let's go ahead and get started with um, uh, Dr. Marissa Litz with uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, the, the title of her talk is uh, Variability in Ocean Conditions Affects Survival of Upper Columbia Pacific Salmon and Steelhead. So. So thanks everyone for sticking around this long today. So my name is Marisa Litz, I'm a research scientist and my area of focus is usually the Washington coast. So it's really exciting to be here and to be um, hearing about all the wonderful things going on in the Upper Columbia Basin. And really I'm presenting this talk on behalf of some NOMA folks, colleagues that you know I used to work with a lifetime ago, uh, but that couldn't be here. So acknowledgements, especially to Lori Weitkamp and Brian Burke from NOAA Fisheries. So the talk outline for today, I'm going to be updating you, uh, taking, talking about scale. We're moving to sort of climate and broad scale oceanographic and atmospheric uh, conditions. And I'm going to give you an update on, on some of the things we're experiencing now, the physical conditions, temperature, marine heat waves, uh, the current El Nino. I'm going to talk about some of the notable biological observations uh, in the ocean and then uh, give an overview of the uh, stoplight chart or the indicators of the ecosystem indicators of salmon survival that, that NOAA puts together every year. And then last of all, I'm going to provide an outlook for Upper Columbia River salmon and steelhead in 2024 and 2025. So take home messages, uh, climate variability will continue to impact salmon returns in 2024 um, and that these stressors affect both the freshwater and the marine life stages. So. 90% of mortality occurs in the ocean, so really important to consider that life history phase. Um, and the effect of the current, really one of the historically strong El Ninos, we're currently right in the midst of right now, um, and the effects of this warmer El Nino is still really unknown, so that's actually a good thing. Um, so let me just couch this talk by saying that we broke all records for both land and ocean temperatures in 2023. Um, so the December values just came out. Land temperatures ranked number one, two, to, two, two degrees Celsius warmer uh, on average than the long-term mean. And the same thing for the ocean temperatures, a degree warmer than that long-term average. And this means two things. It means both that we're in uncharted territory. We are in a place we climate-wise climate we've never been. And then also that the relationships that we've relied on to understand salmon returns in the past might not be applicable. And we have to think, be wise and think more creatively about how to address that. Um, so the ocean is storing a lot of this excess heat. So over 91% um, is stored and the upper layers are accumulating that faster than the deeper layers, but it's affecting the ocean down to 2,000 meters plus. Um, and this is, a, uh, you know, and this is affecting a lot of things. So it's contributing to a higher frequency and longer duration of marine heat waves or these ocean blobs. Um, we're seeing rain shifts. So a lot of subtropical and tropical species are moving up into the Pacific Northwest. It's becoming more commonplace. Um, we're also seeing other ecosystem changes, so trophic interactions, predator-prey interactions, reassemblages of, uh, of whole food webs that were pretty stable. And then finally, changes to physiology, so a lot more metabolic demand when it's warmer, uh, differences, more susceptibility to disease, and things like that. So currently, we are in an El Nino advisory. It's one of the strongest El Ninos since uh, 1950. Uh, typically, this has been considered to be bad for Pacific Northwest salmon. So it leads to um, warmer conditions, and also you begin getting warmer water that gets propagated from the equator up the west coast, uh, and that the jet stream tends to plunge, and it focuses a lot of precipitation off of um, it, the southwest part of the state. So if you look to San Diego County, they're in a sort of uh, a disaster period. They just had the most rain that they had shattering records just in a few days. So classic El Nino pattern. Um, the converse is true. So the 
La Nina patterns, uh, so typically the, the opposite of El Nino, the cooler patterns um, are typically beneficial for Pacific Northwest salmon, higher polar jet stream, cooler, um, wetter but not always conditions. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into some of the detail of that. So, but what we also know is that multiple El Ninos, so up to five per century, can cause ecosystem tipping points that are harmful for fish. And so here's a plot just 1980 through kind of current. Um, and you can see there's been sort of this oscillation, El Nino, and then followed by La Nina periods, not always, but the El Nino is in a frequency of about seven years. And what we've seen since 2015, 2016, which was the last large El Nino that we experienced, was we've actually really not been in an ENSO neutral period since then. We've been oscillating between El Nino, La Nina, weak El Nino, back to um, like almost constantly for the last th eight years. Um, so in the last three years, we were just coming off of a three-peat, and this is was pretty anomalous. Like haven't it haven't had a three-peat La Nina cycle in over 80 years, and then transitioned immediately into this current. El Nino. So just a reminder that El Nino, La Nina are equatorial oceanographic processes. So they affect global weather, but really what's happening is you have a disruption of circulation that's happening at the equator. So trade winds that blow westerly at the, at the equator, they slacken off. And so what this results in is warm surface ocean water piling up on the coast of South America. You get deepening of the thermocline, all this warm water. You have disruption of walker cell circulation, which is atmospheric oceanic circulation at the equator. And this just throws things amok. So you have droughts and fires in Australia, Indonesia, and you have more rain, disaster events in, in Southern California, but it also affects you know, globally the Pacific Northwest. But just a reminder that it is an equatorial phenomenon. And then the La Nina is this sort of converse when those winds kind of pick up and they blow like snot, and then you, know, you have much more upwelling at the equator, things cool down. So this strong El Nino that we're currently in is actually, uh, the timing is fairly good for salmon in that it is expected to transition. So it is, we're, we're right here, so I don't have a, a laser pointer, but we are right there in that plot, kind of right at the peak of the current El Nino. And that means that sea surface temperatures are 0.5 degrees warmer than average at this region known as the Nina 3.4 region. And then um, if we get ENSO neutral is when it will fall below that, which is expected to happen in April. And then we are expected, the forecasters with higher and higher um, confidence are suspecting that we're gonna transition again into a La Nina. Again, this pattern that's beneficial for the most part for fish. So that transition timing from April and then into directly into a La Nina by August could actually benefit a lot of the outmigrating smolts in 2024 and not impact <laughs> the ones that are rearing in freshwater currently. So it's not just El Nino, again, that's an equatorial phenomenon, but we also have um, processes happening in the upper ocean in the North Pacific as well. So in the Gulf of Alaska, Really, this was a new phenomenon that had not really been explained by oceanographers very well until 2013, 2014, with the sort of coin term, the blob, um, that appeared in the North Pacific. And it was the result of uh, a stagnant North Pacific high that just parked itself over the North Pacific. So what that meant was that you had no storm activity, you had very still, no wind blowing, you didn't have overturn of surface waters in the North Pacific, and it just sat there. And um, these blobs are really surface phenomena, so only down to about 100 meters, but it really was impactful because what it meant was without nutrients, without a lot of phytoplankton production, you had sort of this collapse of many ecosystems. So you saw tipping points where there were collapses of Pacific cod fisheries, uh, mass seabird die-offs, and then when the 2015 El Nino combined with the warm blob, you had a very warm uh, Pacific Ocean, and you saw 
uh, effects across the board for salmonids. You saw low body size, low fecundity, poor returns, um, and it really was um, non-discriminatory. It happened across the board for most, or most salmon species, with the exception of Bristol Bay sockeye. Um, but we have seen that this large blob in 2015, 2014, 2015, wasn't an isolated event. And we've actually been seeing sort of uh, this pattern of surface warming in the equator or in the North Pacific year after year after year. And then this last episode, uh, so September tends when it reaches the maximum peak size. Ha uh, in September was the fourth largest blob and the seventh longest, so back to uh, records dating back to 1982. So, um, and it's really nice, you can track the blob using the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment website, which is kind of nice, gives you a current status. And no surprise here is that the impact of the blob right now is kind of nil. So we have had a lot of these uh, large storm activities, huge surf, so it's overturning, dissipating these warm surface um, conditions, and it's really not affecting us now. But stay tuned, it's something to keep an eye on as we progress into the summer, and especially being in El, El Nino. And at the bottom of this plot, kind of creeping up the coast from the California, you start to see some of the warm water. So these, this is a result of Kelvin waves, of uh, coastally trapped warm water from the equator that propagates up and brings with it kind of an assemblage of these subtropical and tropical species. So it's not just the ocean that's being affected. So there's also um, other water supply issues in Washington that we have to be cognizant of. So it was pretty, really pretty remarkable that you know we had drought, we had um, low flow during the spawning migrations in 20, late 2023. Uh, there's been a lot of concern across the state about drought. Uh, we were less than 50% of our snowpack at the start of 2024. In one week after those big storms, um, we that that changed from about 50% of normal to about 75% of normal. But we're certainly not out of the woods. And this plot was from, uh, I think it's January 11th, but a current plot, if you look today, nothing really much has changed. I know it feels cold and then like, <laughs> uh, the weather may not reflect our, our interpretation of this plot, but it, it re we're still below average for snowpack. And you know, this affects, um, water supply throughout the duration of um, sort of the out migration period as well as uh, flows in the summertime. We've heard a lot about that today. Um, and the outlook over the next three months as a result of sort of this El Nino pattern is that we're gonna be, you know, high percent chance that we're gonna be warmer than average temperatures across the state and that the precipitation will be 30 to 50% below average um, kind of as we move forward. So in the ocean, so some of the abnormal or interesting biologs, biological responses that we've seen to recent warming uh, over the last three years. So, um, and this is great for anglers, um, not so much for, some, for salmon. And just a reminder that subtropical and tropical species have specific thermal niches and they're not supposed to overlap with the same ones as salmon. So 2021, 2022, 2023, uh, a lot of tropical species, things such as opa being caught off of seaside Oregon, uh, short-billed spearfish, mahi-mahi caught off Westport. Uh, we had a bluefin tuna wash up on Orcas Island this last summer. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing more and more and more instances of salmon spawning in the Arctic, which is not uh, their habitat. And in the Arctic, salmonids that are showing pinks and chum are actually a considered invasive species by many of the indigenous peoples there, and a nuisance. Um, We've also seen other, other interesting things. So market squid abundance and fisheries popped up following the 2015 uh, El Nino blob phenomenon and kind of persisted for a couple years. 2021 was also the period when we had the heat dome event in June, resulting in billions of die-offs of shellfish and other organisms. Um, European green crab have been making their way in, um, invasively into Southeast Alaska, into Hood Canal, into many parts of Washington estuaries. Um, and then in this last year, you know, we had a new record for mahi-mahi, which again, great for anglers, not so much great for, for fish. And so what does this mean? So why should we care about the ocean? So 
We know that most of the ocean mortality, and this can be over 90% of all mortality over the duration of the time spent in the ocean, um, but a lot of it is concentrated during the first ocean summer. And where are Columbia River salmon? So there's three general patterns to describe sort of movement in the ocean uh, by, by Columbia salmon. One is rapidly northward, coastally, um, following the uh, kind of counterclockwise, the, the Pacific North Pacific gyre. So spring chinook, chum, sockeye, maybe some coho, some also go south. Um, a second pattern for fall chinook and some co is that they stay resident, especially a lot of these hamper reach, sub yearling, smaller fish that have later mi out migration timing. They tend to be more resident off Oregon, Washington. And then steelhead are really a unique beast. They tend to book it offshore really rapidly and they're very surface oriented, which makes them vulnerable to predation, makes them vulnerable to these heat waves in the ocean. And then, you know, but this still is a really a big black box. We don't know a ton about distribution, species overlap, a lot of the ecology of salmon in the ocean. And so the adults returning, they can also have these three patterns where, hey, maybe they're following the shelf back southward, entering the Columbia. Uh, they're coming back from being more southerly distributed, like coho, or heading back from um, offshore. But just, you know, the theme being that there, it really is a black box. Not a lot is known. And so to help kind of disentangle a lot of the un unknown and, um, and variability in ocean survival, NOAA in 20, or 1998 um, began compiling a list of ecosystem indicators. So this is also known as the, uh, the stoplight chart. It's used pretty extensively by managers and forecasters to kind of gauge what is to be expected. So each year is listed as a column. Uh, it's it's uh, niftily color-coded in the red, green, blue uh, characterizations to, and then also um, each row is a specific indicator. And so these indicators, so at the top three, are really more indicative of big sort of climate, atmospheric processes. So things like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index. And what this is, is it characterizes variability in North Pacific sea surface temperature. So cooler temperatures, negative PDO, warmer temperatures, more positive PDO. Also, the Oceanic Nino Index is included in here, so it tells you about the El Nino, uh, whether we're in an El Nino, neutral, or in a La Nina. And then there's a suite of physical, more local, uh, and regional uh, ocean oceanographic variables, and these are sea surface temperature, they're also temperature at depth, salinity, um, things like that. And then, um, there are finally the suite of biological indicators. So I think Jason was in, uh, mentioned a few of these in his analysis of steelhead earlier, uh, but they tell you a lot about these zo either the zooplankton community compositions, so species richness, whether there's um, nutritious, cool water copepods available for the prey of salmon to eat, or whether they're more the neuritic, southern, like weak non-nutritious zooplankton. Tells you about the ichthyoplankton. So these are the baby fishes that salmon eat. So these are the herring and the sand lance and uh, the sardine, whether they're abundant or not, uh, their biomass. And then there's also um, catches of juvenile Chinook and coho. So um, there's still these, these, these weak but, but informative sibling relationships still exist with the densities of juvenile catches in the ocean and subsequent returns. So all in all, so fish that outmigrated in 2023, they experienced ocean conditions that ranked kind of 11th out of these 26 years of monitoring. And again, you can have red years, so you can have terrible years like the 1998 El Nino, where it's almost all red, ranked like 26 of 26 years. Um, and you can squint, you can kind of gauge, so the blob and the El Nino period of 2015 through 2017 were pretty poor. And then we transitioned. So red, typically warmer years, whereas sort of these green years and these are the, this last series of years, so 2021, 2022, eh, 2023 is a mixed bag. So kind of a combination of some really great 
physical indicators, eh, average biological indicators. Um, but these are more indicative of high survival and cooler years. So one thing of note about some of the, by, uh, the indicators from the stoplight chart are that for the first time in 2023, really the, the El Nino, the Oceanic Nino Index, and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which captures variability in sea surface temperature in the north, they're not tracking each other, they're not in phase. Um, and this is very unusual, because they usually tend to track one another quite well. And for years, the PDO was one of the best explanatory variables when it came to gauging what um, salmon returns were going to be. So th that's just one thing that's anomalous. So we're having this El Nino sim signal to the south, but really great and uh, negative cool ocean temperatures in the north, which makes it a little confusing to understand. Um, upwelling is another process that happens in uh, the springtime. So upwelling is the transition from mostly south wind along the coast of North America, or the west coast, to the transition to north wind, so blowing, blowing from the north. And what that leads to is offshore transport of um, surface waters. And that water gets replaced from depth by nutrient-rich water off the slope and shelf. And it brings with it, you know, these nutrients that fertilize phytoplankton, zooplankton, you know, and there's this whole trophic cascade. And the timing is important because typically earlier it sets up, it's preconditioning the ocean conditions for when the smolts reach the ocean. Um, so the yellow line shows 2023, um, and upwelling timing was relatively normal or average. It was not early, it was not late, and that's in contrast to the darker line on this plot, which was 2022, where really, really, really delayed upwelling. Um, and then pretty strong upwelling throughout the duration of this. So a lot of upwelling events, north, northerly um, events. But then it was pretty, it ended pretty abruptly in September. But again, more consistent. So the duration was not necessarily long, but certainly the strength was. And then this plot just shows sort of you can capture the finer scale of these upwelling events. So this is sea surface temperature from 20 nautical miles off of Newport. And uh, so a lot of the monitoring happens off of Oregon and Washington, and much of the stoplight chart is tuned for the Columbia River. But at the same time, it's really useful, and these indicators can be applied kind of north and south. Uh, but so this is through time in summer. Each of the box represents one of the cruises where data was collected for use in the indicator stoplight chart. Um, the purple box is the one, the big one for the salmon survey where most of the information. But you can see as you track the sort of sea surface temperature, it's tracking those upwelling, downwelling events through the summer. So we're, you know, we're capturing both upwelling and downwelling events throughout the duration of that summer. So that's good. You don't want to all be sampling the ecosystem during an upwelling event or just a downwelling event. And then I, I mentioned the zooplankton community. So the com composition of this is really important. So the, there's a difference between the lipid-rich northern copepods that get entrained and, and brought south from Gulf of Alaska versus the neuritic, more coastally oriented southern skinny copepods. So these are, you know, the analogy is the <laughs> cheeseburger versus the salad. And so for salmon, they want the cheeseburger. And what you've seen is really since 2015, the northern copepods, or since 2020 rather, have dominated the species uh, composition. Whereas, you know, there's been a couple blips of the southern copepods, but it's not a true El Nino signal. Like, you're not seeing a ton of the, you know, the red, the, the, the southern copepods dominating the biomass. Um, and that would be bad news for salmon. So this is, again, this uh, juxtaposition where it's, we're in an El Nino, but we're not necessarily seeing El Nino signals in the biology. Um, one thing I did hear from Jen Fisher, she said that there are reports of some tropical species, things like salps showing, off of, showing up off of Bodega Bay in the last week, as well as pyrosomes, which are like this colonial tunicate that are subtropical and like an El Nino species showing up um, off of Oregon as well. But it's early yet, and if we transition, maybe that, that won't be long lived. So some species that trended up um, during the last El Nino really only had average densities in 2023. So these are some of the jellyfish species, like you see the peak during the last El Nino, egg yolk jellies or moon jellies, eh, they're just about average. 
We're also seeing the same thing, California market squid, which supported this huge fishery off of Oregon for the last several years. Eh, we're just down to about average again. Uh, same thing with rockfish, which is kind of an interesting story, but you know, and then there's the whole rockfish conservation area as well. So, uh, other fish, Pacific pompano, a subtropical species, really being caught in these surveys in high abundance during El Nino, blob years, kind of been tailing off and still staying low in 2023, as well as sable fish. And then the return, so I mentioned earlier that uh, the Chinook and the Coho yearling catch densities can be a coarse sort of indicator of salmon returns. Uh, so the ranks on the bottom just show where, like in terms of the stoplight chart, they ranked. So uh, interestingly enough, Chinook um, were ranked fairly on the lower, lower ed, end of the spectrum, 19 out of 26 years, whereas coho yearlings were kind of in the top 10, so 8 out of 26 years. And you can kind of visualize it this way. So if there's a relationship between um, the catches of Chinook on the top two plots here and subsequent jacks in 2025 or 2024 and then adult returns to Bonneville in 2025, uh, you know, there's this sort of coarse relationship. And um, the expectation is that, you know, you're going to be on the left hand side of that graph. So uh, Chinook, you know, we're not anticipating really huge numbers of Chinook returning based on, just on that one indicator. Uh, Coho, on the other hand, uh, based on the, the OPIH, uh, SAR, so this is sort of 2024 returns, hey, we're to the right of that plot. So again, I said these are very coarse, um, and I'll get into uh, a little bit more detail about forecasting here. So these are Brian Burke's SAR forecasts um, based on the salmon indicators. And, and what Brian does, so many of these ecosystem indicators are correlated with one another. So one way to get around that is to conduct a principal component analysis. Um, so you're distilling down all those indicators into a set, one index that captures the variability in, um, in all of that data, the, all of those data sets. So he uses the principal component one scores uh, to generate these predictions. Um, so these are dynamic linear models that Brian has done with the PC1 score of the ecosystem indicators. And they're for Snake River, Spring and Summer Chinook, Upper Columbia River, Spring Chinook, and then on the bottom, the Snake River Fall Chinook and the Snake River Steelhead. So uh, the dots are the observed SARs through time, and then the blue line and the blue dots are the PC1 forecast. And so what uh, Brian is predicting kind of across the board is that we're going to have a slight um, bump if, or, you know, or um, very similar to returns in 2023 for Upper Columbia returns. Um, and just note that there's a lot of variability. So especially for the Snake River steelhead, variation goes from like less than 1% SAR to 7%. So um, a lot of variability, but overall looks like they're going to be tracking or slightly above 2023 returns. So just last slides, a couple of slides, um, and I'll turn it over. But in 2022, uh, myself and also Brandon, who's going to be speaking here in a little bit, we participated in a Pan Pacific Winter High Seas Expedition. So this was five nations, five vessels, two months in February, 131 stations sampled across 2.5 million square kilometers with over 60 scientists um, collecting everything in the ocean from water chemistry to uh, adult catches, eDNA and things. Um, and one of the interesting results from this is that um, we didn't have a ton of salmon catches, but we did have um, some, and this is how they were distributed. And so when we're thinking about scale and we're thinking about interactions kind of at the local level, remember that there's this giant ocean where these salmon are overlapping. And not only that, but in this high sea surveys in 2019 through 2022, uh, GSI, genetic analysis, identified Washington chum among the catches, Columbia sockeye, Washington and Oregon coast, and Columbia River coho. Snake River Fall Chinook and Columbia Steelhead. So they're out there, they're competing for resources and, um, and this is a pretty important period of their life space. So thank you very much.
All right, our next speaker is Lance Keller with Chelan PUD, and his talk is titled 10-Year Confirmation Survival Studies Conducted at Rock Island and Rocky Reach Dams Under, under the HCPs. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just second, Marissa. Appreciate everyone hanging out for the last session of today's um, today's meeting. Uh, what I'm going to present today is the 10-year confirmation survival studies that we conducted at Rocky Reach and Rock Island Dams under the Habitat Conservation Plans for those respective projects. Real quickly, we'd like to thank uh, some of the co-authors on here: uh, the Blue League team comprising of Corey Wright, Kyle Hatch, and Dave Robichaud and the Columbia Basin Research Team that a lot of folks will be familiar with, uh, comprised of John Skalski, Rich Townsend, and Rebecca Buchanan. Real briefly, uh, there is a habitat conservation plan that exists for Rock Reach and Rock Island. Uh, one could think of that as a collaborative approach to ESA protection at those respective projects. They're 50-year agreements. They were signed in 2002, approved in 2004. They contain a no surprise clause, and this is the uh, one of the most interesting things in this document is they're a unanimous decision-making um, body that's comprised of multiple committees, and those committees essentially provide an adaptive approach to achieving no net impact impact or no net impacts for salmon and steelhead. Um, and then once we meet those standards and achieve NNI, the agreement says that we have to number one keep the tools used to achieve those survival standards in place. One can think of those as project operations such as turbine unit sequencing, spill volumes, or northern pike minnow control programs. And then at the same time, the once the no net impact is achieved and the survival standards are achieved, uh, it sets a 10-year clock for a confirmation survival study. There's a three-prong approach that you can think of outlined in the HCP, the first being those survival studies. So the, the HCP sets a high standard of 91% combined adult and juvenile survival for project base. Project base uh, in our neck of the woods for the HCP is the reservoir, the dam, and the tail race, uh, not to be confused with down in the core, the lower river projects where dam survival is the target and so measure just the concrete. Um, in the event that the combined adult and juvenile survival cannot be measured, there is a fallback to 93% juvenile survival only. So once we've achieved those standards, essentially the balance that's remaining there, if you can think of the 91, if we were to achieve the 91% dead on 91%, uh, there would be a 9% balance there. And that is balance is made up through a 7% habit or 7% hatchery production contribution and then a 2% uh, tributary projects that, um, that a lot of folks in here are probably uh, familiar from from a funding standpoint. The combined adult and juvenile survival standards for spring migrating plant species were achieved at Rock Island in 2010 and the following year at Rocky Reach in 2011. So that set the, the clock, if you will, for studies 10 years down the road. Due to some unit maintenance we had at both projects, the Rock Island study was conducted in 2021 and then the Rocky Reach study was conducted last year in 2023. The coordinating committee did, um, agreed to defer those studies until we had a representative of availability of units uh, to measure project survival under. Real quickly, the plant species that are covered in the HCP, Chinook, uh, both spring and summer run, steelhead, sockeye, and coho that have been reintroduced. So real briefly, I'd like to talk about some commonalities between these two studies. They are two different project studies and they did uh, were conducted in two different years and the coordinating committee did provide additional guidance at the Rocky Reach project compared to the Rock Island, but I thought it'd be good just to capture what was uniform across those two projects. First off, uh, the unanimous decision-making body of the coordinating committee determines and approves all the study plans and selects a representative test species for these studies. So the committee did select uh, the testing of yearling Chinook for juveniles and then the evaluation of a returning adult spring Chinook for adult conversion rates. So that was the designated species for both projects. The source of study fish were, were collected from the Rock Reach Juvenile Sampling Facility associated with the Rock Reach Juvenile Fish Bypass System. We did utilize an active tag here, an acoustic tag manufactured by ATS, the SS400 JSATs. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. And then we use the same three taggers for each study. LGL actually has two taggers that are quite experienced, been tagging the majority of their career. And then we had a third tagger from PNNL, Jill Janik, who's, who was a, a great complement to the tag team in both years. 
And then, uh, real quickly, both studies met the statistical precision outlined in the HCP. That is a 95% confidence interval uh, measured at a standard error of plus or minus 2.5%. And then also, both HCPs have uh, flow duration curves in them that the study needs to be conducted under a, a representative flow regime for the duration of the study. Thought it'd be good to talk about acoustic tag technology briefly in one slide because I think we, we've heard a lot about pit tags, but the acoustic tags um, are a little bit different. They are indeed an active tag. Anyone that had an opportunity to capture or to listen to Dr. Daniel Dang's uh, discussion yesterday at the F AFF conference uh, is well aware of the evolution of this tag technology over the years to number one, shrink the size of this transmitter, and number two, boost the operational duration or essentially the days of operation of that tag. The SS400 JSAT was designed by PNNL. It has been dubbed the injectable JSAT. You can inject it with a large gauge needle. Um, but for these two studies, we actually chose to make a small two to three millimeter incision, insert the tag, and then provide one suture um, to seal up that incision. The tag is roughly 15 by 3.38 millimeters, so we're getting pretty close to a pit tag there. And ATS markets this tag at 48 days of battery life. I will say we ran uh, concurrent tag life studies to evaluate and provide detection efficiency probabilities. And we saw for the Rocky Beach study in 2023, approximately 55 days average of, of tag life operation. We did have one tag that went to 96 days though, so that was pretty dang impressive. So real briefly, for the Rock Island study, we used a paired release approach uh, directed by Dr. John Skalski um, with the uh, test group being released in the tail race of Rock Reach Dam, approximately 555 fish, and the control group released in the tail race of Rock Island Dam, approximately 420 fish. And the da two downstream detection sites to measure project survival were at Crescent Bar and Sunland Estates. For those that aren't familiar with that, they're approximately 10 and 20 river miles respectively downstream of the test area at Rock Island. Um, real briefly, uh, both, both release groups are assessed down at Crested Bar and Sunland Estates and you use the survival of the R2 release in this group to remove the non-project area from R1 and what you are left with the R1 group there is project survival for Rock, for Rock Island Dam. On the panel on the right, we have the deployment of the acoustic tag or telemetry receivers. Uh, this is a mix of autonomous receivers that are fully uh, self-contained and deployed along the boat restriction zone line, as well as the four bay of both Powerhouse 1 and Powerhouse 2. And then the green dots are actual uh, shore-based receivers that we had divers install um, either directly or on I-beams. The study design for Rocky Reach was a little more um, in-depth. Uh, 414 fish were released upstream at Wells Dam, and the control group in the release in the tail race of Rocky Reach was 324. That's the typical pair release approach. Uh, previous evaluations at Rocky Reach did go a little bit farther to actually assess route-specific survival at Rocky Reach, and that is accom uh, accomplished through a triple release, or a third release, if you will, into the surface collection structure of the juvenile fish bypass system. That when paired with the control release, which is released at the outfall, gives us survival evaluation and metrics through the bypass system, which then allows the Columbia Basin Research Team to then calculate route-specific survival uh, from an absolute perspective uh, from the, the other route. So the, the project survival itself is off the paired release. The triple release just adds that route-specific survival element. And we had that piece from previous studies and we felt it was valuable to add um, additional data points for 2023. Um, you can see down here, the, because of that route-specific survival, um, the deployment of acoustic receivers was, uh, was quite extensive in 2023 along the face of the powerhouse, um, along the face of the spillway, um, and, and quite a, a little ways out from the powerhouse as well. And then you can see the boat restriction uh, zone deployments upstream as well. I did fail to mention on the previous slide that um, the operational constraints for Rock Island was uh, a target of 10% fish spill, so 10% of the daily average river flow was provided at Rock Island per the HCP and our meaning of standards under those operations, so that's what we tested under in 2021. Rocky Reach is actually fairly unique on the Columbia River. We are the only project that does not provide fish spill for spring margating salmon and steelhead past Rocky Reach Dam. We have verified that we're able to meet the survival standards outlined in the HCP under those operations, so that was the intent of the 2023 study. 
and the detection equipment deployed upstream of the spillway here, you'll see on the, on the right-hand side of the project, was essentially to assess any acoustic tagged fish that in the event we had to spill for a load rejection or uh, flows beyond powerhouse capacity, we could essentially account for those fish that selected that, that opportunistic route of passage and remove them essentially from the survival calculation. So any survival benefit that was uh, presented um, based on that, that route being open was essentially removed. So we're briefly, here's the, the, the meat of the presentation. At, at Rock Island, we have route-specific passage uh, numbers here. We saw the majority of the fish select Powerhouse 2 for route of passage, 71.7%, um, and another 10% through Powerhouse 1, so roughly a little over 80% of Powerhouse passage at Rock Island. The remainder of the fish went through the spillway, and we had a project survival observed and measured in 2021 of 94.45%. Once again, meaning that standard error. Rocky Reach, we were actually able to measure both route-specific passage and route-specific survival through our surface collection structure or the bypass system. We had just under 50% pass through with approximately 100% survival. Through the first two units, which do have intake screens deployed in them, we had a, uh, an RSP of 14.74% with a correlated survival of 98.72. And then the remaining units three through 10 that were operational in 2023 we had uh, just shy of 40% passage with a 93.35% survival for a project survival um, in 2023 for yearling Chinook of 93.78. The other component of that 91 co um, combined adult and juvenile survival is the adult component. Um, while we were not directly able to measure adult survival, the coordinating committee did elect to use adult conversion rates in its place. There are some limitations associated with that that I do believe are worth, worth noting. In a sense, the HCP calls out that, that the adult component needs to measure direct and indirect and delayed mortality associated with project passage. That's not possible here in adult conversion, but we acknowledge it that it's a, it's a decent surrogacy for that um, in its place of being able to conduct that. So the way we did this is we essentially looked at returning adult Spring Chinook that were destined to return above Rocky Reach for Rock Island and Wells uh, for the Rocky Reach project. We assessed those as they started to pass the downstream project that had pit tag detection rates and then followed them to the upstream, most upstream project and then uh, got that statistical estimate down to a project um, a single project estimate, if you will. And in 2021, we saw a conversion rate of 100% of yearling Chinook, or excuse me, adult spring Chinook past Rock Island Dam and 99.74% in, um, in 2023. So at that point, we essentially calculate the adult and juvenile combined survival of taking that juvenile survival, multiplying it by the adult, the adult conversion rate, and we get a combined adult and juvenile survival. So for the Rock Island project in 2021, that came out to 94.45, seeing as the adult conversion rate was 100%. And for the Rocky Reach project in 2023, that value is 93.54%. Under the, the language of the HCP, we then adapt and incorporate those values into their pertinent average of adult and juvenile survival. Um, so you can see here the new adult and juvenile survival for, uh, for the HCP for Rock Island. Spring Chinook is 93.85, and for Rocky Reach is 92.52. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the HCP Coordinating Committee. Uh, specifically in 2023, we had uh, quite extensive discussions on the study design. Um, really want to thank them for their, their extra time um, and the heavy lifting that took to get a consensus on that. Our Chelan PD Fish and Wildlife staff that was responsible for collecting and moving fish around the tag sites. The Blue Leaf LGL team, Jill Janik, PNNL, and the Columbia Basin Research Team. Time for one question, if, or you can wait till the Q&A session. To okay, it was. Wait for the Q&A. Cool. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, where am I here? The next talk is um, by Brandon Chasco with uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and he'll be talking about an integrated model of juvenile Chinook salmon survival. Thanks for uh, sticking around this afternoon. Um, uh, get oriented here. I uh, just want to thank uh, some of the co-authors, um, Andrew, Bob Lassard, Mark Sorrell, 
Jim Faulkner, Jeff Jorgensen, Morgan Pollan, Kevin C., and, and Russ Perry. Um, floated a lot of these ideas past these guys. I should say that uh, I came over from NOAA, where I did mostly assessments on, uh, did some work with Mike Ford on marine mammals, uh, did some squid work that Marissa highlighted. Um, but I've never done uh, market capture models, so this is my first uh, attempt to estimate survival from market capture models. So. Uh, <clears throat> if you see anything that sticks out that you don't like, by all means, uh, I'm, I'm willing to listen. Um, and if you're interested in being a co-author, um, by all means, uh, let me know. Or wait till after the talk and see if you like it, and then let me know. Okay, let's jump right into it. So uh, I work with Andrew Murdoch. Um, I was hired about six months ago by WFMW. Uh, and the first thing he brought to my attention was this issue of low survival of um, wild spring Chinook originating from the upper Columbia River. So I'll be talking about Wenatchee fish specifically throughout this talk. And these are survival estimates and abundance estimates, um, again, for hatchery and wild uh, Chinook from the Wenatchee River. And you can see that the wild Chinook uh, have much lower survival than the uh, hatchery origin fish. And so the question is, if they're uh, originating from the same place, um, what might be driving these differences in survival? Uh, so, um, again, I, I, I haven't really worked on upper Columbia River fish, but um, my first thought was, well, they're not really the same species. So, um, you know, if we just plot when the fish are observed at the Wenatchee Trap and the size of the fish, they're just very different fish. Um, the hatchery fish are much more compressed in their migration timing, and they're much larger, and the wild fish are smaller and more diffuse across the um, temporal scale on the x-axis there. So I thought, well, maybe that could be driving the differences in survival. And I should say, again, this is all based on pit tag analysis, and the pit tags I used were only from wild fish. So I'm going to draw some inferences about the hatchery fish based on the wild fish um, observations. And the pit tag study is for detections at Wenatchee, McNary, and then John Day. So three detection locations. Uh, and so uh, the other thing, that if you look at the hatchery and wild fish, the hatchery being the bigger, larger ones on top there, uh, their travel times from the Wenatchee mouth to McNary are quite a bit shorter than the travel times for the, the wild fish. And <clears throat> if you just plot the travel times, just use like these two-dimensional splines or GAMs, I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but it's just a way of smoothing um, estimates of travel time across that two-dimensional space. You can see that uh, for, the, for the wild fish, they, the earlier smaller fish take a lot longer time to migrate from the Wenatchee, the mouth of Wenatchee, to McNary Dam. And the hatchery fish take much less time, and there's much less of a gradient that is, there's much less difference across the size space area for the hatchery fish compared to the wild fish. And so my thought is that it's not really time that kills a fish, or excuse me, it's not distance that kills fish, it's time. And so I thought, well, maybe this is what's driving the differences in, in survival for these two um, populations. Origins, sorry. So um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with CJS models, but uh, the data are really just ones and zeros. And so you have a fish, say that ID column, that's fish number one, two, three. They all are observed at Wenatchee, so they all have an, a, a one for the Wenatchee. And then for the McNary, they're either a one or a zero if they're seen or not seen. And then John Day is a one and zero as well. And so what you estimate is not only survival, but the detection probability from these ones and zeros. And so you can't, uh, you can't discriminate between detection probability and survival for that last section from McNary to John Day. So it's sort of grouped, at least for this CJS model. So this doesn't incorporate travel times. And so I thought, well, maybe we should incorporate travel times. Again, I've never done these models. So this is kind of my hot read on how I would do this. Again, I'm not, I'm not a CJS expert. Just do other things most of the time. Um, and so there's this whole other data set for each one of these fish. So you know the size of the fish when it left the Wenatchee because it was tagged at the trap right there. And then you know how long it took for each one of those fish to travel from the mouth of the Wenatchee down to Bignary. And again, I, I personally believe you know, that it's time that kills fish and, and not distance. And so 
what you can do is, um, on that sort of right side schematic there, is you can estimate the travel times for each one of these fish based on their attributes of size and when they entered the river. And then you can use that estimate of travel time to inform your estimate of survival in those CJS models. So it's, you're including two sources of information. It's no longer just a model of travel time and a separate model for, for survival. It's you combine the two pieces of information to inform both sides of that, that model. And so let me just graphically show you how travel time integrates into the model. So on the bottom, you have length. That's just a distribution of lengths of fish coming out of the Wenatchee. And this is just hypothetical right now because I want it to look good. Um, and I'll show you the real stuff in a minute. But you can estimate the days by estimating the distance that a fish would travel divided by that length of fish times the body lengths per second. Okay, so the body lengths per second is just a parameter of the model, but it's a biologically meaningful parameter. And that top figure is a distribution of arrival timing to the Wenatchee, or excuse me, to the Columbia River, to the main stem. And the, the functional relationship of that isn't so important, is, except to say that travel, excuse me, when you arrive to the Columbia River affects how many days it takes you to travel downriver. So earlier fish, in theory, would stay longer. And that's what that sort of first um, plot shows, is that the earlier arriving fish have longer travel times. And in that right plot, that right sort of heat map plot, you would see that longer travel times equate to lower survival, and faster travel times equate to higher survival. Okay? And so, what does it look like when I apply these models, my model versus the traditional CJS model, to the observed data? Um, and I, I couldn't really come up with, I couldn't really find a standard way in which people actually show their fits to CJS model in, the lit in any of the reports or literature. But for me, like intuitively, your model should be able to, re uh, to estimate the recaptures at each one of these dams based on your parameter estimates, okay? And so <clears throat> here's the difference between the CJS model and my integrated model. So both models predict the same number of recaptures, okay? There's no difference in, in, in between my model and say the traditional CJS model, except I'm including travel time in my model, okay? So what, <laughs> so then it becomes why, why is this useful? But before I get there, I just wanna show you what the difference in the estimates of survival and detection probability between the two models. And they're virtually identical, okay? So the top row is the survival on the left and detection probability for the CJS, the traditional model, and my model. And the bottom one is the John Day. And again, the John Day is just, um, uh, it's, it's not a unique uh, parameter for survival and detection probability. The point is, is that they're the same. You're gonna get the same estimate of survival that you get from the CJS model versus the model that we've developed, okay? And the other thing that, that my model's fitting to is travel time. So you'd expect that if I'm estimating travel time in my model to inform survival, I should be able to get a pretty good fit of travel time. And so this is just a relationship between the observed travel times on the x-axis and my predicted travel times on the y-axis. It's not a perfect fit right now, I can tell you that, I, and I'm, I'm fine with that right now, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to dial this in perfectly. This is more conceptual at this point. So there's, there's better functional relationships that we can come up with. But for a one-parameter model fitting to 13,000 data points, it's doing a pretty good job. So what is the advantage of using an integrated model that estimates travel time as a function of timing to the Columbia River and the size of fish to get a survival estimate. And this is the reason why right here. So those blobs, again, are the, the heat maps, are heat maps of hatchery fish on the bottom, wild fish on top, okay? Those blue lines are isoplets. So those are the predicted survivals for a particular combination of entry into the Columbia and size of the fish. Okay, and so now you can estimate a spectrum of survivals for all these different fish, hatchery and wild fish. Okay, and so how do those match up to the previous estimates of 
hatchery and wild fish survivals. And uh, if you just take the mean of those distribution, those blobs, and compare what they would fall, where they would fall out on those isoplasts, it's about, we get about 39% for the uh, wild fish, and that's very similar to what you would get for the traditional CJS model, which is what those lines are. And the prediction for the hatchery fish, which aren't even part of the model, is about 56.56, which is very similar to what you get for the traditional CJS model. And this whole thing is what I'm trying to say is, the model that I've developed or that we've developed versus the traditional CJS model, you're gonna get very similar results. However, you can also make larger inferences from the model that we've developed. And so what you can do <clears throat> is you can also say, because this is a model based on the distance a fish travels and an estimate of how long it would take to travel that distance, you can start to look at estimates of survival at anywhere on the river. Okay, so take an estimate, <clears throat> again, no surprises, so I'll make you, there's a no surprise clause, so you sort of have to infer stuff for yourself from this figure. Um, so the, this is an estimate of survival from the Wenatchee River to say 30 kilometers downriver from the Wenatchee River, okay? And so what would the survival of a wild fish be in that stretch of the Columbia River from the mouth of the Wenatchee to 30, mile, 30 kilometers downriver. And what would the survival of those hatchery fish be in the first 30 kilometers downriver from the Wenatchee? And lo and behold, the survival of a hatchery fish would be about 0 0.93, 0 0.94, and the survival of a wild fish would be about 0.91. And so if you have a reference point, you could evaluate the survival of these fish based on that reference point. Okay, so the conclusions from this talk, very short talk, uh, are that we've developed a mechanistic model that uses the length of the fish, the timing of the fish, to make inferences about travel time for that fish, and the travel times of those fish can then be used to estimate survival. And you can do that for any stretch of the river, not just the stretches of the river for which you have the data. Um, <clears throat> these results are um, similar or identical to what you would get from a traditional CJS model. Again, they're scalable to different times and spaces within the river. Um, they have dynamic links to other life history models, so everybody that's trying to get fish to be larger or earlier or later to the river can see how those uh, uh, mitigation actions or management actions might affect survival in the river. And um, I think they provide both inferences for managers and study designers. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the Washington State General Fund. I, d I actually don't know this. Somebody funded this. I think it's Washington General Fund, <laughs> Chelan PUD, Grant PUD, Bonneville Power Administration for funding the pit tags. And I think I got all of them. I'd be happy to answer any questions. We'll have that Q&A time we can use after this next talk, which is uh, Todd Pearson. This is the last talk of this um, round of this session. Uh, he's with, Todd's with Grant uh, PUD, and his talk is titled Large Scale Interactions and Patterns of Salmon and Steelhead. I would venture to say that everybody in this room has got a perspective. Anybody want to debate that point? <laughs> so a perspective is simply a way of thinking about and understanding something, a mental view. And what I'm really talking about in terms of perspective here is about the Upper Columbia, Upper Columbia fish populations, Upper Columbia ecosystem. And as scientists, our perspective is shaped by a variety of things. Three important things that it's shaped by are scale, that's one of the things that this conference is about, integration, which we've heard a number of talks earlier today about integration, 
and also comparison, what we can compare to. The good news for all of us is that perspectives can change. And theoretically, that's why we're here today, right? It's not just for the uh, activities this evening. It's so that our perspectives can change and hopefully our perspectives improve. So I want to look at four local examples. These will be very summary in nature, four recent broad examples, and then finish up with broadening our perspective. So first, I'm going to start off with a, a study that was recently published. And what we found there was that the conclusions differed depending upon the spatial scale at which we looked at stray rates between hatchery and natural origin fish. So at the largest scale that we looked at, which was the Upper Columbia Basin scale, there was virtually no difference between hatchery and natural origin stray rates. But when we looked at the tributary scale, there was quite a bit of difference. And then at the sub-basin scale, which is like at the Wenatchee or Metau level, it was intermediate. So our conclusions differed based upon the spatial scale that was examined. Our conclusions also differed relative to the amount of integration that was involved. So if we looked at a single hatchery, and in this case we were looking at recipient population stray rates as opposed to the previous one, which was looking at donor stray rates, that we could come up with very different conclusions depending upon whether we were looking at a single hatchery or whether we were looking at the effects or spawning compositions that are contributed from multiple hatchery programs. So integration was important. Our conclusions about the life cycle of salmon and distribution of salmon and stray rates and potential domestication selection were also informed by looking at mini jacks. And this was some work that was done evaluating the White River Captive Broodstock Program, which produced a lot of mini jacks. These are the little guys that, that basically stay in freshwater their whole lives. So they mature in freshwater. They're, they're not an adromous fish. And in, in general, they're not. And we found that these fish strayed a lot. They moved a lot and they strayed quite a bit. And this changed the way that we viewed the life cycle of the salmon, that we really need to change how we look about, look at where these fish go. Because some fish will complete their entire life cycle in fresh water and be fairly numerous in some cases on the spawning grounds. So this level of integration is important towards forming our perspective about the life cycle of salmon straying and potential for domestication selection. The types of comparisons we make can also affect our conclusions. And one of the things that we're wrestling with right now is trying to assess our hatchery programs, the PUD hatchery programs. And one of the challenges is, what do you compare those to? To be able to see whether your hatchery programs are meeting your objectives or not. And we used out-of-basin references because that's largely what we had available to us. And we found that in some cases that would not allow us to be able to draw the kinds of conclusions that we were hoping to be able to make. So the types of comparisons we make can also affect our conclusions and our perspectives. Now I want to drift over to broader scale uh, assessments now, and I'm going to use this slide to transition to the broader scale. And I believe that there's a talk that's going to be mentioning the results of this study, and so I don't, I don't want to talk about this. It's not my work by any means. And uh, I just want to take a line from that paper, and you can see it there up there on the slides. It says that most studies evaluating restoration efforts have examined individual projects for specific species, reaches, or life stages, which then that limits the ability of what kind of scale that you can make inferences about. And I think that, you know, if, if we'll be true to ourselves, probably, I don't know, maybe 70 to 80 percent of the people in this room, maybe the percentage is off, but a high percentage of the folks in this room probably are focused on single species. They're, they're focused on um, single reaches or multiple reaches within a single tributary or sub-basin, or focusing on specific life stages. And so I guess by broadening our perspective, it can help us to even interpret things that are going on at those smaller space scales, spatial scales, and biological levels of organization. 
So Dick Beamish, he published an, an opinion paper here recently, and he, he said that I propose it is time to see a bigger picture and improve the understanding of the biological mechanisms that most influence ocean survival. And you can see the other text that precedes that line that I just read. And it's, in part, it's because of the large amount of variation that occurs in survival and some of the other factors that I'll talk about as well within the ocean. Now this slide, or this graph, was a bit of a perspective blower for me. Because most of the things that we see, think about, read about, when we focus on the upper Columbia, have to do with very small population sizes and the potential for, uh, potential for extinction. And so people ask the question, well, are salmon going extinct? Well, well, we'll follow back to that question a little bit, or going extinct, we'll follow back to that in a little bit later. But you'll see that from 1925 to 2019, the, the total commercial catch of pink chum, sockeye, coho, and chinook by all countries has been going pretty crazy here. So there are more Pacific salmon in the ocean recently than in recorded history, according to Dick Beamish. This is a pretty remarkable thing, considering some of the other areas that are having real big issues with regards to salmon abundance. And one of the things you'll notice in this is that the pink salmon there are very numerous, chum salmon are also very numerous, and sockeye salmon are also pretty numerous. So these are the, the species that are driving these large abundances uh, in the ocean. And you look at coho and chinook, and they're a very small uh, proportion of, of these total uh, run sizes. And we don't have a whole lot of pink and chum salmon up here, do we? So those influence some of our perspectives with regards to salmon and, and how many salmon there are, are, are out there, and that it it also different, differs quite a bit uh, geographically. So are salmon going extinct? What would your answer be? <laughs> it depends, exactly, thank you for saying that. That used to be the thing in graduate school. It was about ecology and context. If you wanted to get good grades on something, you'd always write, it depends, right? Are salmon going to extinct? Well, it depends. It depends on the ESU, it depends on the geography, it depends on which species, and so on and so forth. This piece of work is one of the more interesting pieces of work that I've run across over the past number of decades. And many of you are in this room are probably very familiar with some of this work. But it's, it's just really very interesting because it's very broad scale, it's very integrative, it looks at a variety of different kinds of interactions across a variety of different species and taxa. Just fascinating, fascinating work. Now you've probably already read the, the portion at the lower portion there, but I'm gonna read it again for emphasis. Greg says that the evidence indicates that ocean, open ocean marine carrying capacity can be mediated by top-down forcing by pink salmon and by ocean heating. And that large-scale hatchery production likely has unintended consequences for wild salmon, including Chinook salmon. He goes on to hypothesize that pink salmon and the warming of the NPO, North Pacific Ocean, and adjacent seas will lead to declines of all salmon. Sorry, I'd love to have a better message uh, to bring than that, but that is what, what Greg wrote in this, in this paper. So it's, it's extremely interesting, it's extremely important, and it's probably some important things that we should be considering when we consider what potential ocean effects are being had on some of the, the species that we work with up here. Now this is another relatively recent paper. Most of the papers that I've been citing here are relatively recent, most of them since about 2000, 17, many of them since 2020. So this is, is fairly recent stuff to the literature. This, this paper here was particularly contentious because of some of the statements that were in the paper itself, and it was a synthesis of the coastwide decline in survival of West Coast Chinook salmon. And, and David Welch and co-authors write that the notion that contemporary survival is driven primarily by broader oceanic factors rather than local factors should be considered. Ambitious Columbia River rebuilding targets may be unachievable 
in part because of some of the patterns in SARS that he was observing coastwide. Now, this paper got a lot of attention, and there was a lot of debate about the veracity of this work. And if you're interested in, in some of the juicy details about the debate, you can find some of that. The, the Independent Scientific Advisory Board, I believe, did a review on this, and I believe that's available online. There's also been this story of the incredible shrinking salmon, right? Nothing magic here, nothing, <laughs> nothing to see, but there have been a number of papers that have documented up and down the coast that Chinook salmon have been shrinking in size, and there's also concomitant a shrinking in the fecundity of these fish as well. So from this paper, body length and fecundity of populations across a broad geographic region are affected by similar processes that are leading to recent declines. This is, this is really important, right? Because this, a lot of this stuff is happening out in the ocean, but this affects freshwater productivity, right? So if we're getting fewer eggs in the gravel, Chris, right? Less fish to be able to look at egg to fry survival with. If, if, if we're getting fewer eggs in the gravel, that's gonna be, we're gonna have less opportunity to produce more juveniles. So this is a really important factor that is, a, that is an ocean factor that is affecting our ability to be able to increase freshwater numbers. Now I could talk about a variety of other different papers and uh, I'm not gonna do that because we need to go off and do other things, right? But there are a variety of other papers that talk about the, the effects of the ocean on size and, and also looking at predation effects. Uh, Brandon, I don't know where you are. He was the, the lead author on this paper uh, down there below in terms of talking about trade-offs between increasing marine mammal predation and, and, um, and, and harvest of Chinook salmon. So th there's a variety of large-scale papers that are out there that are really influential and important for us to consider in terms of broadening our perspective to put things into context. So that's my hope. My hope is that as we go away from this conference, and I know we're only day one, but maybe some of you will be leaving today, that we will broaden our perspective and prioritizing broadening our perspective, both with regards to scale, integration, and comparison. So to just kind of end up here, sum things up, I would advocate that in terms of scale that we, we begin to incorporate broader and broader spatial scales. And we've heard a number of talks today that have, that have done that exact type of thing. Also broadening our, our temporal scales as well. Broadening our biological levels of organization. I mean, we wouldn't know some of the things that we know now without Greg's emphasis on looking at interspecies interactions and assemblages within the ocean. And it's very broad and it's very important work. So broadening our biological level of interactions or, or, or bio, biological, biological level of organization, not just from the perspective of a number of fish within a reach or a population within a sub-basin or an ESU or even at the species level, but broadening it beyond that. And then for some of the modelers in the room and those that interpret scientific information, this, this whole issue of what types of information can be scaled up versus what kinds of information can be scaled down is also a really important factor. Uh, Tracy, you were talking a little bit about scaling up from the microhabitat scale and, and scaling up from that point. And is that appropriate in all cases? Or if you're measuring things at a very high level and then you're trying to scale that down, is that appropriate in all cases? In the case of the straying example that I talked about earlier, the first example I gave of a local example, that would not have been okay to scale up or to scale down. So those are important things for us to consider as well in broadening our perspective. In terms of integration, many of us work on individual projects or on individual programs, whether they're habitat projects or whether they're a hatchery program. and, and um, rolling them up together so that they can even be compared to one another, rolling them up so that we get a better and broader understanding of what's going on. 
Same thing with species and life histories with regards to something like the mini jacks we talked about and some of the, the cases of the different life histories that were migrating out at different times that Mark talked about earlier today. And then cumulative effects. Sometimes we may not see much of an effect when there's a single event, but when there are multiple events of a, of a similar nature, they can roll up to be quite important. Comparisons. This is one of the hearts of our ability to be able to determine causation or to be able to make certain kinds of conclusions. And so having in and out of basin uh, references is really important. When we're looking at trends, when we start and end a trend is also very important. If you start in a trough and you end in a high point, you might generate very different conclusions than if you start at a high point and end in a trough. Also comparing winners and losers is also another potential important way to be able to generate information from comparisons. So in closing, the benefits of broadening our perspective is that hopefully it helps us to have more useful in, um, understandings, gives us more effective ability to be able to make decisions and investments, and it's more likely to achieve objectives. So I'm done. You don't have to kick me off. All right, I'm going to invite up Marissa, Lance, and Brandon, and we'll do our 15-minute uh, Q&A. So per usual, we'll have the standing mic, as well as our roaming mic person, I think, is in the back, back center. So raise your hand if you have a question or come up to the standing mic. So. My question's for Brandon, so I'll let you get settled. <laughs> um, so it seems like in addition to body size that uh, Columbia River conditions could be a big factor in travel time. So have you thought about including environmental variables into a mark recapture model? <clears throat> Is this on? Uh, yeah, we have um, quite a bit. So we didn't, um, for this talk, I didn't include any of the um, hydro regime or any dam effects or any of those covariates that could easily be incorporated into into the model. But um, yeah, definitely, definitely have thought about them, but um, just want to keep it simple for this talk. I'm going to indulge myself and ask a question. Oh, well, I'm just going to go for it. Um, Marissa, I was curious, Have with those um, ocean expeditions, have they actually um, captured any of our spring Chinook, upper Columbia spring Chinook or upper Columbia steelhead? Do you know um, if that's? So there's snake steel, or the, I think it was snake river fall Chinook, and then a Columbia steelhead. But I don't know where it was from. I'll have to look back. But they certainly have. Like, they're, they're out there. I'll just say, I think the most shocking thing about that cruise when we were out there was just how little there is out there. I mean, it's a desert. I mean, it's, there's just nothing out there, <laughs> um, which I was kind of surprised about. I also have a question with the, like, out-migrating hatchery fish being in that small window versus the wild fish in the wider window. Are you losing the fecundity on the back end by increasing the conveyance out. So when they come back to actually do the stock recruitment that we saw earlier for the wild fish having the higher ratios of success in spawning and producing one to one, are these hatchery fish losing that like feed or any type of learning traits coming out by getting them out fast? Uh, that's an overarching question, I know. <laughs> I don't I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I don't do that sort of stuff. Maybe you guys do. <laughs> it seems plausible, though. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> uh, maybe this is a question for everybody sitting up here on the panel. Do you all believe that there are more salmon in the ocean than in recent history? Or was at least that one figure that we looked at potentially just reflecting our 
humans' ability to catch more fish and do it more efficiently. Um, do you see those numbers kind of reflected in the same surveys that you've that you all have done? Maybe I'll take a stab at that. So that figure, it, it, that might have been catch, but there's similar um, data available on the North Pacific Anadromous Fish Commission website that is overall hatchery production. And it, those trends are driven by crazy billions and billions of hatchery releases of pinks, of chum in Southeast Alaska, as well as in Russia, in Korea, in Japan. So, you know, th this idea that there is a, you know, we're, we're beyond carrying capacity in the North Pacific because of this overabundance of hatchery fish is very real, in my opinion. Yeah, and I believe, I believe that's where those data came from, so. Can I just yeah, yeah. I just make one other point? This is a freebie, I guess. So one of the things that uh, I get a little bit frustrated with is, is when people say, well, yeah, well, that's the ocean. There's nothing we can do. But there are things that we can do that are directly within natural resource managers to be able to at least advocate for. And that, those things involve things such as predator management, Right, there are going to be trade-offs. Right, um, predator management, um, harvest levels, hatchery production. These are all things that are kind of within the natural resources space that that can be considered, and that could affect returns of salmon. So I guess it's just a plug to suggest that there probably are things that we can do, and we probably, at least from my perspective, we shouldn't just throw our hands up and say it's the ocean. There's nothing we can do. Lance, were there challenges using acoustic sensors right next to the spillways, like just massive? Yeah, that's a great question. There are some challenges. I mean, there is, the closer you get to a hydroelectric project, there is a louder or more ba background noise, if you will, but the acoustic tags, such as the injectable JSS, are designed to overcome that background noise and be detected. Um, Typically, you deploy an array and then um, you drag around some test tags to see what you're hearing and assess your range of detection. Uh, a lot of the times that can be done with a, with a remote control boat, if you will. Um, but I think it's just, um, it need, definitely is a consideration in designing an array to the questions you need to answer and the resolution you need as well. Thanks. Good talks, everybody. Appreciate it. Um, I had a question about steelhead and their integration with our knowledge of what happens out in the ocean. So I appreciate the talk that says, you know, what we know is steelhead, you know, cruise out into the pelagic ocean and they are surface oriented. Um, and then I also saw the graphics that show the blobs that are out there. And it seems to me that there seems to be some sort of correlation there, at least with those two indicators, um, that there would be some, there's some overlap with that and our lack of ability to get steelhead back. Uh, I'm just curious if anybody's really looked at that or not. So again, I'm gonna refer back to those 2022 high seas surveys. So they were done in 2019, 2020, it was kind of cut short because of COVID, and then the, the large scale effort in 2022. And in the first two years, um, across the entire survey grid, it would, they were just using a, a, a trawl, um, and it had a head rope down about 20 meters. So, and not a single steelhead was caught. And then in 2022, Dick Beamish had the idea of using a Japanese-style pelagic gill netter. And so one of the Canadian ships was deployed to just fish like with this pelagic gill netter. And they caught like dozens, like I think it was 57 steelhead um, over there, you know, like two weeks or something that they were out there. And so, of course, the panels of the gill net were really, um, you know, were capturing that, that surface 20 meters. So, that was pretty compelling evidence and, you know, supports that sort of working hypothesis that steelhead are surface oriented. And I'm not really sure what the genetic or, or like, um, 
But I know certainly one of them was an upper Columbia fish. And, uh, you know, so they potentially are very vulnerable. There's other studies on juvenile out migration through Columbia River estuary that, you know, because they're surface story, I don't know if this is because of hatchery practices, because of, um, you know, buoyancy issues, but, you know, they're, they're vulnerable to avian predation and their size because they're larger, um, and pinnipeds as well. So, um, yeah, we need to teach steelhead to swim deeper. <laughs> so. I have a question for Lance about the survival through the dam that you were talking about. Could you elaborate on the composition of wild fish versus hatchery fish in that group? Uh, yeah, for one of the specific studies or? For the JSATs. For the JSATs, yeah. So th there was a difference in the 2021 to 2023 studies. Our 2021 study definitely had a, um, a larger minimum fish tag threshold. So I think the minimum in that study was 110. Uh, the HCP coordinating committee in reviewing those results um, had quite an extensive discussion analysis looking at things such as tag burden, barrow trauma um, in the literature. Um, and ultimately we did decrease our, our, tag, our minimum tag size for the JSATS application at Rocky Reach in 2023, down to 95 millimeters, I believe. And so we, we definitely do feel that there was a, a smaller fish that was incorporated in that 2023 study, um, and some of those fish were indeed wild. Could you speak on the, the differences in the group size of hatchery fish versus wild fish being used? Oh yeah, so, okay, thank you for the clarification there. So yeah, so those fish being um, collected at the Rocky Reach sampling facility. They are indeed um, a run a river component at that point. So uh, when a fish comes in, we essentially, if it meets the tagging criteria, we would select it. We're definitely not cherry picking for wild versus hatchery fish. Um, but indeed, as folks have seen in, um, in presentations today, the abundance um, is definitely stronger there for, for hatchery fish versus wild fish. But um, I do think that the move to 95 millimeters as a minimum tagging threshold uh, for the 2023 Rock Reach study definitely did represent uh, wild fish to a greater extent than has been in previous studies. I will say we also have some very limited si um, sample size data associated with that. We do know hatchery versus wild fish for the 2023 study. It's very, very small from a sample size perspective, um, but those, those uh, survival rates for those small group of fish uh, were slightly higher than, uh, than those we observed for hatchery fish. But once again, very, very limited sample size. So uh, we're a little cautious to look at that in that, in that fashion. Last call. Okay, let's go ahead and thank our speakers. All right, just a few quick housekeeping things. First off, uh, the evening social, as you all know, is at Pibus. It's at the uh, event center, so it's at the far, from this side, it's the far end on the left. Um, it's about a quarter mile, 10 minute walk, not too far. It goes from 5.30 to 9. Um, at 7.30, there's a raffle. Uh, to get in, make sure to bring your name tag, and if you have that name tag, you'll get a free raffle ticket. There's some cool items. One thing I actually helped, um, at least my idea was uh, a signed book by Ben, uh, Goldfarb, he wrote the book Eager. It's about beavers and kind of their, their role. So we have a signed copy of that book. That's one raffle item. There's some other cool items there. Uh, it's, there's no full dinner, but there, there are hors d'oeuvres, but there's plenty of uh, restaurant options in Pibus and you know around downtown here. Um, there's alcoholic beverages uh, with your name tag. You can potentially get a free, uh, you get a free um, beer ticket. There's 210 of them. We didn't expect this many folks. So, um, so there's no guarantee. So get over there, get one of the 210. And then after that, they're available for purchase. Um, and then let's see. Uh, last but not least, tomorrow, uh, 8 a.m. is when the kind of morning social coffee hour starts and 8.30 is our first talk. So um, thanks everybody and have a good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is any presenters who is presenting tomorrow and want to drop off your presentation, you can do that now tonight or first thing tomorrow morning at 730. Thank you.